Esteemed guests, the program is about to begin. At the end of the event, please remain in your seats until our guest speakers have left the room. Then exit through the rear of the auditorium. Thank you. Estimados invitados, el programa está por comenzar. Al final del evento, por favor permanezcan en sus asientos hasta que nuestros oradores invitados hayan salido del auditorio. Después, salgan por la parte posterior del auditorio. Gracias. Please welcome the director of the Earth Institute, Alexander N. Halliday, and the Prime Minister of the Republic of Finland, Ms. Sana Marin. It's great to see everybody here in one place. It's fantastic. <clears throat> My name is Alex Halliday. I'm director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. I've been here a couple of years. Uh, New York's a fantastic place to be, but this university is particularly strong in the area of climate and sustainability, uh, which is why I'm here and why the Earth Institute is here. We're particularly excited about today's program uh, because of that. And today we are um, introducing as part of the World Leaders Forum event Uh, on behalf of the university, I'm particularly honored to welcome the Prime Minister of the Republic of Finland, Her Excellency Ms. Sana Marin. She will give a keynote address entitled The Climate uh, Sustainable Welfare Society. Is it the model of the future? This will be followed by a question and answer session with the audience moderated by Karina Gore, who is director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. I'd like to thank President Bollinger for his support of this event. I'd also like to thank our partners. This event is co-hosted uh, by the World Leaders Forum, the Earth Institute, and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. In fact, the event has attracted huge interest, apart from the people in this room. The lecture is currently live streaming to 2,000 students enrolled in the Sustainable Development Goal Academy course, Conversations with Global Leaders. This is particularly important for us because we're now contemplating a new kind of construct at Columbia University, a climate school. And so as we focus on this, and in particular the issue of uh, education in climate and engagement with the climate crisis, it's incredibly important that we bring in world leaders to engage with on this topic. So I'd like to start by saying a few words about Finland and Colombia in particular. Uh, before moving to Colombia, I was at this place called Oxford. Um, And one of the other faculty there was a guy called Tolkien, J.R. He was a little bit before me. We didn't quite overlap. Um, but one of the things he said was, learning the Finnish language was like discovering a complete wine cellar filled with bottles of an amazing wine of a kind and flavor never tasted before. It quite intoxicated me. So um, you should read Tolkien's stuff on this. Colombia is also intoxicated with Finland, so it's great to have you here. Um, in fact, it is one of only two universities on the East Coast that offer Finnish as a full academic class, providing an incredible opportunity for our students. The Finnish Studies Program at Columbia University, which we have some representatives here today, uh, offers courses in Finnish language and culture, and the students taking Finnish represent a wide range of schools and areas of study from across the university. If after today, after today you are interested in learning the language, please check out the, what's available online. Sana Marin was appointed Prime Minister in December 2019. She is the youngest Prime Minister in Finland's history. She has been actively engaged in politics pretty much all of her adult life. In 2014, she was elected as second Deputy Party Leader of the Social Democratic Party. Then in 2015, 
was elected to Parliament for her first run. She also chaired Tempera City Council from 2013 to 2017. And from 2017, she was the first deputy party leader. While involved with Parliament, she has been a member of the Grand Committee, Legal Affairs Committee, and Environment Committee. Environmental values are close to her heart. Under her leadership, Finland is working to build an environmentally sustainable future and achieve carbon neutrality by 2035. So we look forward to hearing more about Finland's future plans from Ms. Marine today. Before doing so, I'd like to quickly say a few words about Karenna Gore, who will field the discussion uh, following her talk. Karenna is the founder and director of the Center for Earth Ethics at uh, Union Theological Seminary. The Center for Earth Ethics bridges the worlds of religion, academia, policy, and culture to discern and pursue the changes that are necessary to stop ecological destruction and create a society that values the long-term health of the planet. The center is also an affiliate of the Earth Institute and Karenna serves as a member of our faculty. Karenna's previous experience includes uh, serving uh, in the legal center of Sanctuary for Families and serving as Director of Community Affairs for the Association to Benefit Children. She has also worked as a writer and is the author of Lighting the Way, Nine Women Who Changed Modern America. The university is absolutely thrilled to host Prime Minister here, the Prime Minister here on campus today, um, to speak to students in particular uh, about the critical intersection of climate change, gender equality, and social welfare. Please welcome Prime Minister Sanna Marine to the stage. Thank you. So a bit awkward moment there with the handshake. <laughs> but dear, dear all, dear students, first I want to thank the University of Columbia and the Earth Institute for inviting me here today. It is a pleasure to be here with you to discuss how we can build climate neutral societies in a socially just manner. We are now in the midpoint between the year 1990 and the year 2050. In the last 30 years, the world has taken important steps in fighting climate change. Climate science tells us we need to become climate neutral by mid-century in order for the humanity to survive. In the 30 years we have left to become climate neutral, we have to do much more than what we have done so far. Climate change is not a matter of political opinion, it's a scientific fact. But we need political decisions in order to make change happen. We need to implement the Paris Climate Agreement, and we need political choices to make sure that the climate actions are done in a socially just way. This is my key message to you today. We can build a climate sustainable society and we can build it in a way that is just and fair for all. I would like to start by telling you a few words about my own country, Finland. We are a country of only 5.5 million residents, beautiful nature and skilled people. Finland is located in the northern part of Europe, our western neighbour is Sweden and our eastern neighbour is Russia. Finland is called the land of thousand lakes, but actually that is underrated because there are over 100,000, 160,000 lakes in Finland. You may also know that we have a coalition government of five parties and each party is led by a woman. Four of us are under the age 35. When Finland became independent 103 years ago, and still after the Second World War, we were one of the poorest countries in the world. Today, Finland tops many of the world's country comparisons, whether for press freedom or for the happiness of citizens. We have built our modern society and economy based on the Nordic welfare model. We have an open economy that can adapt to change. 
The key to our success is our good quality education system that is free from tuition, the early childhood, and all the way to universities. We invest in R&D and we are one of the leading countries when it comes to innovation. <coughs> the most important aspect of our education system is, is that it provides everyone with equal opportunities. We want to make sure that the circumstances you are born into do not, do not define your future. In the heart of our society is the idea that every child, child can become anything. This is also the reason why our government is investing in daycare, in education, in research and in lifelong learning. Besides education and Nordic welfare state, one of the reasons why Finland has succeeded is our way of making decisions. We are used to coalition governments and we are used to cooperate with different parties. As an example, a big part of my job as a prime minister is to negotiate and try to find compromises and build consensus between different parties in the government. And we do even cooperate with opposition parties in many issues. I know it sounds hard work, hard work, and it is, but what it does is that we have continuity in the decision-making processes. This is how we turn Finland from a poor country into welfare state and welfare society. We need continuity in politics also in order to tackle climate change. We need everyone on board if we want to reach our climate goals. The key issue is that the Finnish or Nordic model makes adapting to change easier. That enables us to be leaders in climate change. Finland aims to be climate neutral by 2035. Our government adapted this ambitious goal based on scientific anal anal analysis by our national climate experts panel. To achieve climate neutrality, we will accelerate emission reduction measures and strengthen our carbon sinks at the same time. In concrete numbers, climate neutrality in 2035 means that we need to cut emissions by 35 million tons compared to current levels. This is three times the total transport sector emissions in Finland. And we must enhance our carbon sinks by 3 million tons. This corresponds to almost half of the agriculture emissions in Finland. Our climate policies are based on academic research and they are supported by the maturity of Finns, our citizens, industries, civil society, businesses and political parties. The first thing we must do is to say goodbye to fossil fuels. In Finland, we will build the first, world's first fossil fee free welfare society. Our long-term energy policy goal is to phase out the use of fossil fuels in the energy sector and move towards an emission-free energy system. In electricity, electricity production, we have already taken big steps. In 2018, nearly 80% of Finland's electricity production was based on carbon-free energy sources. 46% of energy was produced by renewables and 32 with nuclear power. However, however, as a country with cold winters, heating is a big issue that we have to focus on. In the same year, 2018, 53% of district heat was produced with fossil fuels and peat. This is why our government is investing significantly in policy measures to decarbonize our heat production. And how will we do this? Finland has already banned the use of coal for energy by 2029, and we are providing energy companies with incentives for investments to replace coal already by 2025. By 2030, we will halve the domestic use of imported mineral oil, like petrol, and phase out the use of fossil fuel oil in heating. In properties owned by the central local governments, oil heating will end already in 2024. 
the use of peat for energy will be at least halved by year 2030. In building heating, we will encourage investment to move away from fossil fuel to sustainable options such as heat pumps and ground source heat. We also need new technical, technological solutions and, of course, energy efficiency. Secondly, we need to decarbonize transportation. The transport sector accounts for one-fifth of, our, of all our emissions. We will halve these emissions by year 2030, but we will not stop there. In autumn this year, we will publish a national roadmap to fossil free, free transportation. In order to reduce transport emissions, we will need to phase out fossil fuels in transportation, as well as to reduce transport performances and to promote the transition towards more sustainable mobility. Emission reduction measures will include re reducing the use of fossil fuels by increasing the blending obligation of biofuels from 15% in 2018 to 30% in 2029, and supporting digitalization and automation of the transport system. In the long term, we see sustainability produced biofuels mainly as a tool for reducing emissions from heavy-duty vehicles and aviation. To promote more sustainable mobility, we will encourage cycling, walking and public transportation. We will take climate change mitigation more strongly into account in land use and urban planning. Furthermore, we are enhancing the charging infrastructure of ele electric vehicles. In the future, petrol station change will be obliged to provide a certain number of charging points for electric cars. We will set a national application to build charging infrastructure for electric cars in housing companies and business premises. Thirdly, we will reduce the emissions from our industry. And again, a key element of this work is based on cooperation. We are developing sectoral low carbon roadmaps together with our industries, including the chemical, technology, forest and energy industry. These roadmaps describe the actions industries can take to reduce their emissions. We also support our industry in transition. In early February, our government decided to step up a new climate fund. The fund will focus on combating climate change, promoting digitalization and boosting low carbon operations in manufacturing industries. The fund will be one way to channel investments in developing the circular economy, clean technology solutions and energy efficiency. Public funding alone will not be enough to make the urgently needed transition to a climate neutral society happen. Fortunately, Finnish businesses and industries largely, largely see investing in climate friendly, energy efficient and circular solutions beneficial for their activities. They see that by being early adapters of new technology, they will be a better place to compete in the global market. Particularly in country of forest and peatlands, also the land use sector plays a central role in achieving climate neutrality. So a fourth key element of our government's climate policy focuses on reducing land use sector emissions and enhancing carbon sinks. At the same time, we need to protect, protect biodiversity. The government will develop a comprehensive climate program for the land use sector. The program will include a broad set of measures. We wish to safeguard the management, growth and health of our forests, promote afforestation and reduce deforestation. This way we will increase our carbon sinks. On the other hand, the program will include measures for reducing the emissions of swamps and peatlands, promoting climate sustainable management of swamp forests and strengthening the carbon sequestration of agricultural land. 
Dear friends, we will not meet our climate targets or stop the catastrophic loss of biodiversity unless we urgently decouple economic growth from greenhouse gas emissions and the use of natural resources. We must stop overconsuming our planet's resources and we do more with less. We need to think carefully what products could actually be replaced with services and we need to make sure that whatever we produce is produced sustainably, resource efficiently and can be repaired, remanufactured and in the end recycled. This is why Finland invests a lot in transforming our economy from the linear make-use-dispose model to a cir circular economy. We are currently developing a long-term horizontal circular economy program to boost our efforts. The program's focus areas include circular economy in the construction sector, the role of cities and regions, cir circularity in heavy industry and new technologies and business models. The program is prepared in cooperation with key stakeholders and will be completed this year. Building and construction entails enormous potential for promoting circular economy and cutting emissions. In 2017, Finland launched a, lo a low carbon roadmap for construction. It aims at including the carbon footprint of building materials in Finnish regulation for new buildings by 2025. This means that we will set threshold values for life cycle emissions and dif different building types. Now our government aims to enhance the circular economy and increase the recycling of materials in the construction sector. Promoting the circular economy is also a key element of our government's sustainable taxation roadmap. And finally, we are putting our climate ambition into legislation. The government will present its proposal, proposal for a new Climate Change Act in early 2021. The Finnish Climate Act has been in force since 2015, but now we want to strengthen it as a guiding instrument. Emission reduction targets for 2030 and 2040 will be added to the Act in line with the path to climate neutrality and climate negativity. The land use sector and target for strengthening carbon sinks will also be included in the Act. Dear friends, in order for the climate transition to be fair and just, we need to engage citizens in active dialogue about climate policy. That is why we have just last week set up a new climate policy roundtable that includes representatives from local communities to the interest, industry, the youth and the trade unions. We also do concrete measures to implement just transition. When we announced a raise in fuel taxes, we also lowered the income tax for the least, least earning citizens. Some areas of the country are affected disproportionately. This combined with urbanization can mean that negative effects pile up on just some communities. Local action taken by cities, cities, regions and states is important driver of low carbon development. I know that many US states and cities have ambitious emission reduction targets and climate policies. We are working together with some US states like Maine and Michigan on climate action and the research and development of sustainable and green industries. Also in Finland, several cities have set themselves more ambitious climate neutrality targets than the government and are working actively together to reduce their local emissions. Dialogue and joint policy development play an important role in preventing people from starting to feel insecure about their future. In Finland, 
The Nordic welfare model enables a fair, socially trust transition and helps us to balance the impacts that, for example, the decline of polluting industries could have on the regional economies, jobs and services. A key enabler of a just transition is education. As I mentioned earlier, basic, vocational and even university education in Finland is free of tuition. Educational paths are designed in a way that allows for a smooth transition between different types and levels of studies at, le at different stages of life. In line with our government's recently published climate roadmap, we set particular priority on continuous learning, employment services and on the job learning to enhance people's security in the face of change. Dear friends, my core message to you is that without a holistic view of sustainable development, we cannot fight climate change. Without the social and the economical, the environmental transition is not possible. This is where Nordic model comes to play. I believe that open markets, robust social security and good quality public health care system are just as essential in tackling climate change as are energy taxation and carbon pricing. These elements together with free education helps to ensure that during challenging times one can focus on seeking new opportunities. Dear participants, Climate change is a global challenge. According to the UN Environmental Programme, if we really aim to limit global temperature rise this century to 1.5 degrees, countries must increase the ambition of their climate policy over fivefold. For reaching even two degrees target, the ambition would need to increase threefold. The gap between global climate action and emissions is huge. This has to change. We must more work harder together to turn the international community to a path towards a safe and sustainable future. It is important that particularly major economies, including US, take action. In ensuring successful outcome at the COP26 in Glasgow this November is very important. The meeting will be an important political moment where countries are to think if their climate policy is enough. Ambitious targets and pledges to climate neutrality by mid-century are essential for the world to catch up with the science. The European Union wants to lead by example. Last year, during the Finnish presidency of the European Union, the member states decided that the EU will become climate neutral by 2050. We are currently debating how to reach that target all across Europe with the Green Deal proposed by the European Commission. At the same time, we need to acknowledge that countries are at different stages. Finland continues to become committed to contribute our fair share. Also, the EU and its member states remained the largest contributor of public climate finance to, to developing countries, including the multilateral climate funds. In 2018, continu contributions from the U EU, its member states and the European Investment Bank totaled 21.7 billion euros. However, we cannot solve the climate crisis only by public funding. We need to steer private funding to be better aligned with the global climate goals. Together with the World Bank, the Chilean and Finnish finance minister launched a coalition of finance ministers for climate action last year. The coalition has big transformative potential. Finance ministers are in charge of many effective policy tools to address the climate crisis such as all those related to carbon pricing.
Science tells us that all countries must replace fossil fuels with sustainable options and significantly enhance energy efficiency. This means that some natural resources are better left unused. In the Arctic, the alarming changes caused by climate change are real and rapid and taking place now. They are profound implications for economies, societies and ecosystems in the region and but also worldwide. If we are committed to fighting climate change, we must leave fossil fuel resources untouched in the Arctic. Dear students, climate change will not be stopped by individual choices, but by politics. I mean that our individual actions, actions count, but we require more the systemic change in society, not just switching plastic bags to paper bags. But having said that, if we can't get any, everyone on board with what we are doing, we will fail. We can't get emissions down if inequality goes up. This is why I have today outlined to you the Finnish way, combining a welfare society with ambitious climate policy. We believe that is the best way, sustainable way into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for that wonderful address and for your global leadership in this time of, of climate crisis. We're really delighted and honored to have you here. <laughs> Do you need a It's napkin? only water. It's only water. <laughs> and it's not a plastic bottle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have laid out a model, a Finnish Nordic model, a social welfare state model in which there is a holistic view where environmental, social and economic factors are all seen together. I wonder if you feel when you're in the United States as if you are an ambassador of this way of thinking and if so, if you could let us know how you see the United States right now. Um, <laughs> And, <laughs> and whether you might have some words of guidance about how we might think about this model and how it connects to our situation. Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, the question. Uh, actually, uh, reporters have asked me this all day. Uh, and I, I, I've been trying to be uh, as polite as I can be. <laughs> Of course, it's very worrisome that the uh, United States are planning uh, to leave uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. We need all the countries, United States, uh, China, Russia, all the big players uh, fighting climate change because Finland is a small country with 5.5 million residents. We cannot solve the crisis by ourselves. We are trying and wanting uh, to make um, uh, an example to the world that we can uh, build climate neutral society in socially uh, just way so that the change we need to make and we need to make it now because we don't get second chances uh, on this uh, but we can do it in a way that actually benefits ordinary people uh, creating new jobs creating new technologies so we want to show the world that we can do uh, the change uh, in a way that actually helps everyone in their own lives. So I think this is a very uh, powerful message. And of course, as the Prime Minister of Finland, it's very important to me uh, to speak here with you. It's honored, I'm very honored to be here with you because you are the young generation. You are the change. Uh, and when I'm speaking to you, uh, I'm convinced that you will uh, take uh, these words, this presentation, and, and the example of Finland uh, in the policies 
in, in the United States, because there are future leaders in this room also. Thank you. I was very interested to learn that uh, Finland has ranked number one in the Global Happiness Index uh, for two years in a row. And in looking at the factors that are, are used in this survey uh, by, conducted by Gallup, I see GDP per capita, social support, life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and corruption levels. And it is noted that Finland scores particularly well on generosity. I wanted to ask you a two-part question. One, a little bit about how one uh, nurtures generosity in, in a culture, in a society. But then also on this notion of, um, of growth, because you have put forward economic growth as important. And as you just told us, it is important that we decouple economic growth from greenhouse gas emissions and from consumption. So how, what are the particular challenges in doing that? Well, of course, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, we are only one country, a small country, and very dependent on the global economy. So as climate uh, change uh, and uh, tackling climate change, we cannot do this by ourselves. Uh, and I think the economy is a key factor how we can make the change. So we need to decouple uh, economic growth from the use of, of um, material resources. So we need to shift the circular economy, as I pointed out earlier. And I believe that there are also a big potential for economic growth there, because we are now, now not using uh, the materials that uh, second time that we are using uh, the first time. And I think there are also a lot of potential in that uh, creating new jobs and, and, and actually creating economic growth. So I think circular economy is the key element here, and we should focus on that. You were at the United Nations earlier for International Women's Day, and uh, you have been a leader on the issue, and Finland as a whole has been a leader on gender equality. What is the relationship of gender equality to sustainability? Well, it's everything. It's everything. Uh, our government's program is based on the Agenda 2030. Uh, we want to build a society that is economically, socially, but also environmentally sustainable. It's in the core of our policies. Uh, and gender equality is uh, basis for, for everything. Um, as I mentioned a few times before, Finland only have 5.5 million residents. So we had to harness all the uh, resources of everyone in Finland. We couldn't just uh, pick that half of the population are working and half of the population are doing uh, things that um, uh, helps us to build our economy and our society. We needed everyone to be involved uh, in policy, politics and that's why Finland was the first country in the world uh, to grant women full political rights, uh, the right to vote, but also the right uh, uh, to run for office. Uh, because we needed everyone on board of make, transforming Finland from a poor Aquarian country to welfare state that is uh, now. So I think gender equality is one of the key elements that we need uh, to also tackle climate change. And it's, it's also because uh, half of the population are women. So also women need to be in positions where they can make decisions because actually climate change is, uh, is hitting hardest uh, uh, the women and girls worldwide and es especially in poor countries. So we need gender equality to fight climate change and we need women in powerful positions uh, to make the change what, that we need. Thank you. We're going to begin the...
we're going to begin the, the, the question and answer period from, from this, the audience in just a moment. So please line up on either side and, and think about your question. And before we do that, I'm going to ask one question that comes uh, from the Sustainable Development Solutions Network students who are uh, watching on live stream. And they would like to know a little more about your vision to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2035. Particularly, what energy sources uh, do you envision and also about protecting and regenerating the carbon sinks, those two sides? Hmm. Well, actually, uh, I said before, uh, and, uh, and I will say it once more, that actually, uh, a big part of our um, electric uh, uh, production of our electricity is is already uh, uh, climate uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, eighty percent, over eighty percent of our electricity are being made uh, by renewables and, and also by by nuclear power, which has not their issues, but but still, it's it's carbon free. But the big issue is heating and how we can move away from um, burning uh, to more sustainable options. And we do need the technological advancement here because uh, we don't know all the solutions yet. So that's why we are investing in education, in, in R&D, in research, because we do need the technological solutions to shift the heating uh, from burning uh, to more um, climate sustainable ways. Uh, and actually one, uh, one um, uh, specific uh, thing that we can do, and we're actually also implementing um, legislation on, on this or making change in, in our legislation, um, that uh, we can use the heat from data centers uh, uh, to heating our houses. So it's, it's very important and actually there are a lot of uh, heat coming from data centers so, so this is a big potential for us when we are now lowering the tax on data centers that we can use the heat in, in heating our houses. That's fascinating. Thank you. So I would like to um, ask that people introduce yourself before you ask your question and please be succinct so that we um, have a chance to hear from more people and uh, we're going to do we're going to try to do one at a time um, and see how that that goes oh, uh, thank you prime minister for the very inspiring talk uh, my name is tom i'm a graduate student at the department of chemistry and my question is uh, you mentioned that of course, Finland is a very small country and that you need to get everybody on board. Uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is in getting everybody on board? And like when you talk to other world leaders, what do you tell them to try to convince them to, to uh, take Finland as a model and, and, and uh, build the climate neutral, neutral society? Well, I believe in uh, leading uh, by example. So we are doing lots so others would do as well. Uh, we we of course don't have the power to say other world leaders that you need to act now and it's your job. Of course it's their job because the globe is everyone's and the climate, uh, the climate doesn't know uh, boundaries between the countries. So everybody has to do their, their own uh, bit of tackling climate change. But we don't have magic tools uh, to make the world leaders change their policies, but we can lead by example, and I think this is very important that we are doing exactly that. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you, Madam Prime Minister, uh, for being here with us. My name is Zenre, and I'm a medical student here at Columbia University. So my question uh, is of relevance to recent elections in both our countries, namely healthcare reform. Uh, so, first, do you believe that a national uh, public health care system should be administered at the national level or at the local level? And second, do you support or oppose the decision by some local authorities in Finland to contract the providing of health care services to private for-profit uh, entities? Uh, well, Finland has uh, 
very good quality healthcare system that is also very affordable for its citizens. And of course, we have the legislation and every uh, Finnish citizens have the same rights for healthcare. Uh, but actually, the local authorities, municipalities are those that provide the services to our citizens. And we are actually now reforming our, our social and healthcare system um, to, to a larger level of regions because um, many Finnish municipalities are quite small and there are actually people moving out from a different regions, to especially bigger cities, so we need this reform. But when you compare um, Finland's healthcare system, the US healthcare system, actually Finnish healthcare system is very uh, cost efficient and very good quality uh, for everyone. So. The, of course, the countries are different, and each country needs to make its own decisions concerning the public services. But I find that uh, the Nordic model, uh, the way we are uh, producing uh, uh, healthcare services in Finland, in Sweden, uh, in Norway, in Denmark, are very good, very cost efficient, and, and uh, beneficial for everyone. The second part of my question was uh, regarding local authorities in Finland, do you support or oppose their use of private, for-profit services to provide health care to some people? Well, we also have private uh, health care uh, providers in Finland, and I believe that we need, we need both, but then we have to regulate uh, what kind of uh, charges the private uh, healthcare providers have, and we need to have regulations on how they work. And we do have these regulations already. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Hello, Prime Minister. Thank you for coming to Colombia. There are a lot of schools out there, so thank you for choosing us. Um, I'm Sambhav Jain. I'm the senior class president for Colombia Engineering. My question to you is, what do you think young leaders like you bring to the table in fight to combat critical issues of the future like climate change? Well, one of the key reasons why I became politician was climate change. I felt, when I was 20, I felt that the older generation didn't do enough and didn't do fast enough uh, to secure the future for uh, young people and for children. Because we don't, as I said, we don't get second chances. This is our chance to act now, and we do need to act now if we want to uh, stop uh, the climate crisis we are facing. So I, I think it's very important that young people engage in politics, uh, they act, uh, they take action uh, in every level so that we can fight climate change because, as we can see in the world, uh, the generations and the uh, people in the decision-making positions aren't doing enough. So please, everyone in this room, everywhere else, all, all the younger generations need to act and we need to demand more from people in a power, powerful positions. Uh, thank you so much for being at this forum. Uh, I'm Ahad and I'm a computer science uh, student at Columbia University. Uh, so, I think Finland serves as a model for tackling a lot of like major world issues such as climate change and you know uh, providing good education. But I was wondering, uh, you know, how Finland is planning to deal with some more recent uh, issues such as like the uh, the coronavirus or the COVID-19, you know, which. Uh, you know, it's very demanding on the healthcare system. And uh, so I was wondering how Finland is planning to, you know, work with its healthcare system to come up with a solution on, or stop this, uh, you know, pandemic from spread spreading, I guess. Uh, coronavirus, that you are, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, actually, we have a good healthcare system, as I said. So we are very uh, good prepared uh, for uh, epidemics. And, and pandemics, so, so I feel strongly that our um, civil, civil servants and our healthcare um, uh, people in, in healthcare are very uh, skilled. They are uh, very good at tackling exactly this kind of situations. So I'm very, uh, I don't have that uh, big worries how the Finnish healthcare providers and, and 
and um, uh, workers are handling the situation. Actually, I'm more worried about what the virus does uh, to the global economy. So how, how it will en impact the economy and how the uh, global economic situation will impact Finland. So this is my big worry uh, about this. Uh, but Finland is very well prepared and we have all the structures and all the uh, b b programs needed uh, exactly the, these kind of situations. Hi, thank you for coming. I am Janai Meekins. I'm from MOT Charter High School. I'm a senior. Um, and in America, a lot of the problems that we have kind of deal with um, the, so the economic inequalities that are in a lot of the communities in America. And having a health, living a health, healthy lifestyle and a greener lifestyle for the earth takes a lot of money. So is there a way that we can live a greener lifestyle with, with able to, while being able to afford that lifestyle? I think this is a very important question. I think this is the key question because if people don't have the resources to make uh, better choices, they, then they just can't make them. So it's very important that in policies uh, that we do, uh, we always uh, look how it impacts socially uh, and economically uh, individual uh, people and individual families. So I think it's very important that we are making decisions in a way that is also socially just and fair as as I uh, said before, uh, and, and this is the reason why we cannot build uh, the whole burden on individuals. We need the systemic change and the people in, in powerful places and positions need to make the change that is also socially just and fair. But we cannot uh, burden this on individuals because it's unfair, it's unfair. If you don't have the money to make the changes in your own life, then you just can make them. So I think it's very important that we also uh, are looking at this angle when we are tackling climate change. Madam Prime Minister, I'm David Chitanava, graduate student from Columbia Engineering and Fellow of the Center of Building Infrastructure and Public Spaces. Discussions about congestion pricing doesn't lose its actuality in New York City, but it's also important in Finland. So, uh, despite strict social economic arguments from the opponents, implementation is still planned. Observing your governmental program released in December 2019, there is a full chapter about reform of transport taxation with the aim of managing traffic. So my question is, what's your opinion about the importance of congestion pricing and what will be your future steps to overcome these political issues? Uh, what pricing? Sorry, I didn't... Congestion hear. pricing about traffic and congestion pricing when there's a lot of traffic? Ah, oh, oh, yeah, now I am. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't know the word uh, in, yeah. in English. Uh, we do have this in our governmental program um, and, and we are now building the legislation that allows cities uh, to use this kind of, um, uh, what? In instruments. What, what is the word? For <laughs> instruments? Uh, congestion pricing. Con congestion pricing. Yes. Yeah. We're now building a legislation on this that cities could use. Uh, and actually, it's not... Um, there are the climate aspects as, as well, of course. But actually, it's more to do with uh, the city planning and how we use the land. Do we use it on traffic? Do we use it on parking? Or do we use it on something else? So I think it's uh, more importantly question of land use and the use of, of city uh, uh, property uh, and, and the city uh, land. So there are these two sides. It's not the most uh, effective way on tackling climate change. Of course, it affects, uh, impacts on this as well if the people will have uh, choices that they can make, for example, better public transportation. And if we would use uh, the money from, from this uh, to public transportation, then it would have a uh, significant climate impact as well. Oh, sorry. 
Um, first of all, good evening, and hi, nice to meet you. My name is Gabriela Grace McAlpin. I go to New York Harbor High School on Governor's Island. I am 15 years old, and I am a sophomore. And this rolls into my question. First of all, your, your presentation, absolutely wonderful. The more and more I hear about Finland's, Finland's plan for greener lifestyle, more inclusive government, everything I'm hearing, on my, because obviously I'm from New York, obviously I'm from here. <laughs> what I hear from you, it sounds like a utopia, because everything, <laughs> because everything I'm hearing is, so from everything I hear from social media, from local like politics, like more greener lifestyle, more inclusive, getting more people, um, listening to our, our people, <laughs> sorry, listening to our communities, they make it seem as if it's an impossible task. Like, they always bring money into it, like, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that. But how you, um, you're, like you said, you're leading by example, and everything you're saying, it seems plausible. Everything seems plausible. So what, what, what my question is, is how did you achieve all of, how did you achieve all of this? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I don't mean to be funny. It's just <laughs> like, I'm, it's like, with a, with, a country, with a country like ours, where we are a strong country or whatever, we always talk about, oh, we're, we're a democratic society, so we say, but we don't really listen to our communities. Mm. And I'd say, I don't want to say anything mean about anyone, but <laughs> we don't really, we learn, um, they, we're being led by leaders who don't, oh, oh my mm. question, sorry. <laughs> I, I was we, just going to You on. already asked, how is it possible? Yeah. Okay, how is yeah. it possible? Thank you. Yeah, it is possible. It is possible. It's been possible in Finland. It can be possible everywhere else. But uh, it needs uh, people to act. People to want uh, better lives. People to want better societies. People to vote. If you don't vote, then it would be impossible. So it's very important that uh, we don't see it as a utopia. Because we, Finland was a poor country. Uh, we did have very, we have had very uh, hard uh, historic uh, with civil war and with, with uh, war with Russia and we have, have had very difficult history in Finland. But we have built a society nevertheless because we have, uh, the political parties in Finland have chosen to go to a better direction. My party, the Social Democratic Party, uh, has, has built uh, the Nordic welfare state model uh, together with the Centre Party uh, in Finland and all the other parties that have been um, or have come later on uh, supporting uh, the Nordic welfare state. And actually the Social Democratic Party has done this in uh, all across Nordic countries. So parties and leaders need to have ideas uh, and, and I idealism. And then we need pragmatic solutions how we can build uh, those idealisms uh, into concrete uh, legislations and in concrete uh, decisions. And actually I think that it helps us that we have, co have had coalition governments because nowadays in Finland I think almost all the parties or all, all the parties from the left-wing parties to the right-wing parties all agree that the Nordic welfare state is a good social model. So there isn't a big divide on this issue, and I think that uh, the system that we have uh, in, in decision making and in, in politics also helps us to have continuum in society and that we don't have such a big polarization than maybe uh, in countries with two party system. But of course, every uh, country's situation is different, but it all starts from the demanding of individuals, of, of people's and people's choices and voting, that they can support uh, the political ideas of, of parties and of, of uh, politicians. I'm and also in the gra grassroots uh, uh, movements, grassroots movements. engagement. Yeah. yeah. So, I just thought that maybe I said it wrong, grassroots. <laughs> in the grassroots, yes, yeah, in the grassroots. Yeah. Thank you. I apologize. Time has, has gotten away from, from me. We have time only for one more question. Um, please. Hi, um, I'm Gloria. I'm an architect. I work here in the university. Um, 
honored to have you here. Uh, my question is, where does the farm animal industry fit into your carbon neutral plan? Um, you're meaning uh, the food production? Uh, yeah, involving animals. Uh, well, of course we need to change our agricultural system to more sustainable one. Um, and a big part of this is actually European Union funding. Because European Union has um, uh, uh, funding systems to agricultural that is big impact on the agricultural systems of each country. So I think um, we need um, uh, also a change in the European Union level so we can change our agricultural system to more sustainable ones. Of course it matters what you eat. It matters uh, what you consume, uh, it matters what you eat. I've been vegetarian myself ever since I got into politics in 2000. Uh, eight ever since I was first uh, uh, running for office in the Tampere City Council, my hometown. Um, and I decided that uh, if I'm speaking one thing, I should also act accordingly. So we all know that um, uh, uh, the choices that we made, uh, m make uh, have an impact. Uh, but not all animal production is bad. Of course, we have the sustainable models there also, and we have, have uh, uh, many uh, agricultural um, uh, uh, businesses or businesses uh, that are actually uh, making uh, their work in a very sustainable way. So there are variation there. And we need to promote uh, those who are doing it uh, right and who are doing it uh, sustainable. Thank you so much. Uh, we are honored that you came to see us here at Columbia University and we just want to thank you for your time and all best wishes on your travels and your work. Thank you very much. <laughs>